afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. Today we have the pleasure of having noted pathologist John Marnarsic, uh, an avid teacher of pathology online. He has a free worldwide global following in pathology, and we have a couple of his students here too to be able to see it. Uh, so first, before we turn over to John, let's introduce the panelists. Hello, Slavin. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Slavin Gorkovic. I'm uh, from Crete. Right now, I'm in Kuzna, Poka, Romania. Welcome, Slavin and Simon. Hello, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, the modern father of pathology. It's a, really a, an honor to to be here with Dr. Benarsi. Well, welcome, Simon. Simon's kind of muted because he's uh, at nighttime in, in Japan and the walls are thin. Hello, Marco. How are you doing, Marco? You unmute and introduce yourself, please. Hi to everyone else. Uh, good, good afternoon. My name is Marco Antonio. I'm from Bolivia. It's going to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Please. Thanks for coming, Marco. Okay, John, thank it's you all you yours. Much. Okay, well, thank you for giving me all these nice people here. I really appreciate it. And what I really appreciate is that when I was a neuropathologist at a hospital, uh, I was actually called out sometimes at a midnight or 1 a.m. And probably not many pathologists can say they were called out for frozen sections at that time of day. So even though it was kind of shocking to me because I wasn't used to something like that, uh, I realize that the people that I'm doing the service for are called out like that regularly and routinely. So whatever my little hassle was, uh, was nothing compared to the neurosurgeons that I was working for. And I'm always, always very happy and proud to work with the neurosurgeons. Uh, I could never be that smart and I could never be that energetic. But I also know that with the guys that I worked for, that they really, really, really not only appreciated pathology, but they always felt like they were a little bit uh, behind in the recognition of certain things. So what I'm gonna be presenting today, is, be very brief, is what I have been presenting for, oh, about the last eight years uh, at my medical school. I have a very nice medical school right now. I'm here in Puerto Rico, Kawas. And uh, every year the students have what they call blocks like these the cardiovascular block the respiratory block the endocrine block and at the very end of the year which this is we have what they call oh i guess the students call it the neuro block you know i call it cns because that corresponds to the uh, material that i'm going to be showing very very briefly and we also call it the uh m b b block for mind, brain, and behavior. It's a conglomeration of everything that relates to the brain and the mind and the personality. And I, I get allotted uh, six webinars to present all of my uh, neuropathology material. And uh, what I do at the beginning is take about 20 or 30 minutes to summarize what I'm gonna be talking about. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, pull out the guns and shoot yourself in the head because we're not gonna go through those six hours of material. We're just gonna talk about the introduction and what the neurosurgeons and the neurologists and the medical students always feel the most appreciative for having a little bit experience with, and that's the actual pathology at the cellular level. So as long as we're talking about the cellular level of disease, uh, can I put down my, um, a browser now and put up my PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, yes, please, John. Can you see? Can you see yes, Dr. Virkow? Yes. Can you see all of the slides on the left as well? Yes. Okay, yes. I believe in uh, presenting things in uh, not in full screen mode, but I want the students mm -hmm. to be able to so, kind of look at what's next coming up. And the most important number that they look at is this tiny little number down here. Do you see this number here? <laughs> <laughs> my arrow's pointing to, it says yes. 18. Yes. Because if they walk into my class and there's 673 PowerPoints, they find it <laughs> to leave. But if it's a relatively small number, they think they could probably tolerate it. So we're right. going to look at 18 PowerPoints. And I think we can start out by saying something that, you know, all the old time pathologists say, you know, like me, 
is that sometimes we make fun of the psychologists and the neurologists and uh, not so much the neurosurgeons. We say, well, you know, they're talking about these diseases, but we can't see them under the microscope. So, you know, they're probably not real diseases because the father of pathology, you know, 200 years ago now, is it? Okay. He said something that was absolutely phenomenal which revolutionized medicine to this very day. He said that all diseases are the results of visible cell abnormalities. And this is how I usually start my whole course out now, but I think it's very appropriate to say, you know, when it comes to things like uh, the brain and the mind and the behavior, sometimes those visible uh, cell abnormalities are not so easy to find. Well, now that pathology has gone over to genetics, I guess if we could say, the uh, a anatomy of a gene or the anatomy of a chromosome or the anatomy of a DNA molecule probably can ultimately explain even all of the behavioral diseases, the ones that Rudolf Virchow or even somebody with an electron microscope could never uh, say. The reason why many of you have not heard this before is because he died in 1902 and right about the time before he died is when he had this kind of famous uh, expression here. This is about the same time another really smart guy by the name of uh, Albert Einstein, who you may have heard of, he also said something pretty spectacular about that time, uh, actually a couple years later. He said E equals MC squared. So I guess whatever Rudolf Virchow said in those days was a little overshadowed by Einstein. Now, when I teach my pathology course, it, I go to all of the so-called blocks or the so-called systems. So when we go into the heart diseases or endocrine diseases or lung diseases, we generally start talking and all the pathology books are like this. I use the uh, father of all pathology books, Robbins, but even Rubens and all the classical ones generally start enumerating the diseases and they generally go into things like degenerative diseases, degenerative cellular changes, loss of cells. And then they get into the inflammatory disease classifications, the infiltrations of various cells, neutrophils, macrophages. And then finally, at the very end, they talk about neoplastic. Of course, if you're a pathologist, you're going to talk about neoplasms all day, and you're probably not going to bother with these because we love to talk about tumors. We like to be the stars of tumor board. But uh, this is probably a good way to approach neuropathology as well. But I would like to make one little addition because in neuropathology, we have a fourth category called traumatic, which is not generally easily fitting into the generation of cells or the infiltration of inflammatory cells within the central nervous system or uh, probably neoplasms because we're talking about trauma. And it's probably a, not only a big part of neuropathology, but I bet you it's probably a big part why all of those neurosurgeons are called into the uh, operating room at two in the morning, probably on a routine basis. And I really, really appreciate that you do that because a pathologist might be doing it in the emergency room maybe once in his entire career. Now, uh, what I then explain is that if you generally want to go back, now there's another category here that sometimes gives us a problem and that's the problem of congenital diseases or developmental diseases, de uh, diseases of embryologic uh, problems, okay? Uh, failure to development. And just as though we're finding out genetically, that's basically a very similar process what we're seeing with neoplastic diseases. Perhaps the congenital diseases might be a failure to grow. The neoplastic diseases would involve genetic mechanisms that are involved in the failure of regulation of growth. So when I go into these various categories then, and I'm just gonna spit them out pretty quick, knowing that true diseases are at the cellular level, even if they are at the molecular cellular level. I start out with talking about this crazy thing that we call hydrocephalus, which you could probably use that term to describe all abnormalities of CSF flow disturbances, rather than just something that causes uh, uh, ventricles to bulge or to have increased pressure. We talk about the common congenital diseases. You could call them malformations. There's other terms that are used. 
we talk about the perinatal CNS injuries briefly. And these are not entirely different, remember, from these original classifications here. They're just kind of like an expansion of it. Spend a lot of time talking about trauma. We spend a lot of time talking about what you would call a stroke, okay, vascular diseases, uh, and even more than strokes, but other vascular diseases, a whole wide family of infections. If you looked at the organisms that are involved in true pathology of the central nervous system, they go all the way down from viruses to, you know, wor big worms. It covers practically the whole phylogenetic uh, spectrum. It even goes as far to cover infectious agents which don't even have DNA. And of course, those are the prion diseases, okay? The prion diseases, which you may or may not ever deal with, are basically uh, infectious organisms at the uh, non-DNA level. How do you like that to blow your mind? And of course, when we talk about the demyelinating diseases, everybody thinks, oh, okay, well, well, you know, that's multiple sclerosis, but I want to remind you uh, something, and I hope you take this out of this conference, is that all myelin is is insulation for all those crazy little wires, uh, fibers inside your brain. So anything that damages the brain, whether it's trauma, whether it's infection, whether it's a tumor, is going to disrupt the insulation to the wires. And of course, when we go through the other systems, you know, like heart, like endocrine, like all the classical systems you could think of, sometimes it's hard to talk about degenerative diseases. But in the case of the central nervous system, the degenerative diseases probably are perhaps the lion's share. And I told the students just the other day, not only will a large number of those patients have degenerative central nervous system diseases, but eventually they will get it themselves. Sometimes I feel a little Alzheimer's coming on to me as well. So if I hesitate between words, maybe I'm getting a degenerative senior moment. Okay, uh, the uh, toxic diseases, the genetic diseases, the metabolic diseases. And remember, these are not mutually exclusive, but they're still classified this way. And of course, I have to restrain myself when it comes to tumors because pathologists love to talk about tumors. But we're gonna talk about, rather than going in to dissect these classifications even more, we're gonna go into some general cellular reaction patterns and then we're going to uh, talk about the cells that are involved. Because when you think about it, for as complex as the central nervous system is, there's only two kinds of cells. There's neurons and there's glial cells, right? And if you wanted to add blood vessels, I guess you could. But please, uh, this next PowerPoint is really the most important, in my opinion. It's a picture of edema. It's a picture of gliosis, and it's a picture of demyelination. You can see it's a spinal cord here. Uh, almost all of these diseases and these diseases, whether they're called demyelinating or not, almost any type of non-specific local or diffuse central nervous system disease or lesion is gonna have perhaps all three, but elements of perhaps all of these. Now, I know the first thing you probably think is, well, you know, you can't have edema of the brain. The brain's inside of a walnut shell. It can't swell. But yeah, you're right, it can't swell. But it could poke through those little uh, dural membranes like the fox or the tentorium or the cisterns. If you have a localized edema, it might shift a part of that hemisphere across the fault strictly because of swelling. The same thing is with the uh, cingulate gyrus, okay? You could have that kind of herniating or uncle notching. Sometimes if it presses up, it could actually try to get through that area where there's no walnut shell. There's just a thin walnut septum and to go into the uh, infratentorium. And of course, uh, the uh, swelling of the cerebellar tonsils. So that's one way you can talk about edema. And even an, a brain that's totally dematous is not gonna 
weigh twice as much as a normal brain. They just can't expand that much. Of course, if it's a spleen or a liver or anything else, it could weigh twice as much. Let's talk about gliosis. We spend a lot of time uh, talking about various inflammatory diseases. We spend about a whole webinar talking about acute inflammation. Then we talk about another webinar talking about chronic inflammation. Well, we all kind of remember that the acute inflammation is basically characterized by neutrophil infiltrates and the chronic by either lymphocytes or macrophages or both. But the type of cell that, uh, predominant type of cell that forms this inflammatory reaction, and remember, it is a nonspecific inflammatory reaction. It could be secondary to trauma. It could be secondary to a tumor. It could be secondary to an encephalitis or meningitis is the glial cell. So what inflammation is to the rest of the body that's not central nervous system, gliosis is to the central nervous system. And we're going to talk about the various glial cells. You know, there's astrocytes, there's oligos, there's microglia. And even though they're called microglia, they're actually derived from the macrophage line. So if we said that many macrophage cells are involved in the chronic inflammatory process, you're not really making the exception for uh, microglia because microglia are really modified macrocytes. And finally, demyelination. It, it's really a knee-jerk reflex to most of you when I, anybody uses the word demyelination, you think of, oh, well, that must be multiple sclerosis demyelination, or if you want to call it demyelinization, sometimes I go both ways, is just like gliosis, and it's just like edema. It's nonspecific. It could be present in just about any significant central nervous system disease we talk about. And you want to know something? When you get demyelination, you often get edema. When you get gliosis, you often get edema. When you get edema, you can get gliosis. So no matter what's present, the one thing that's almost always present, all three of them, is edema. And isn't that really nice and convenient? Why? Because edema means water. It could be vasogenic due to uh, flow abnormalities. It could be due to cytotoxic edema, but it's more water and more water means more H2O. And more H2O means more H. And more H means more hydrogen. And more hydrogen means more proton. And more proton means more protons to spin in a magnetic field. So that's why just about every lesion that we could talk about, especially the focal ones, are going to result with a increased MRI signal if you tweak the magic, the magnet in such a way that it's called T2 weighting. Okay, so isn't that really nice and convenient? Uh, here we go. As long as we are saying we're going to be talking about diseases at the cellular level, we might as well introduce the main cellular characters. Well, you can't ignore the neurons even though they're really, really, really in the minority, and there's probably 10 times as many glial cells supporting the neurons as there are neurons, you always have to put them at the top. A general rule is that they are so much bigger than any of these other glial supporting cells that you could probably say, and I know I've heard this said before, I didn't make this up, that the nucleolus, nucleolus, not a nucleus, nucleolus, of a neuron, if you cut it properly, it very often is about the same size as a whole nucleus as some of these supporting cells, okay? I'm not gonna say anything about this. You've seen this a million times, and you know a hell of a lot more about it than I do, especially if you know, you're practicing in that field, or even if you're a uh, first-year medical student that studies neurophysiology for you know weeks and weeks. But you know you have the axon, you have the soma, you know, know that the axon, okay, could very easily be 10 times greater in mass and weight than the actual soma or the perikaryon. You know that you have a bunch of little uh, mitochondria here which go into the axons. But the one thing that doesn't go into the axon is the nissel substance. So when you're looking at a neuron and you see these kind of things coming in, if you're lucky, 
Look at the one where the nissel substance does not go in. That's more likely to be the axon. The dendrites, for some reason, the nissel goes in. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything more about it. I think if I told you or any uh, second year medical student, smart second year medical student, or maybe even a dumb one, you know, that how many neurons are in this field, you could probably count them and come up with a number like about 15 or something like that. And all these other little cells where you could barely see the nucleus would be the supporting cells. And of course, where you see nothing, it could be myelinated or unmyelinated fibers. I'm gonna show you a little bit closer now, my little rule of thumb. Do you see the nucleolus and this nucleus? and this neuron. Well, the nucleolus is about as big as all these other little nuclei, the various glial cells. Don't make the mistake of looking at a glial cell and trying to identify it too quickly because you could be wrong. But there's a certain few tips that you should know. And probably one tip is that if the glial cell, see this is almost all glial cells here, I see kind of a big cell here, or maybe here. These could be neurons. You're never 100% sure. You know these are blood vessels. But any small nucleated cell, it has a halo around it. The halo is white because the halo is fat. And you know fat washes out. That's why it looks white. That's why fat cells look white, OK? That's why foamy macrophages with cholesterol look white. If they wash out, there's probably fat, and you know the Glial cells that are making the fat are the oligodendrocytes. What oligodendrocytes are to the central nervous system, the uh, uh, Schwann cells are to the peripheral nervous system. They make the fat myelin, and that's why they have nice halos around them. Uh, you can have blood vessels here. Okay, if you really pressed me hard and you said, are these four or five things neurons? I'd say, yeah, maybe. They look quite a bit bigger. But don't forget, the big rule doesn't always easy apply. What I can tell you is probably the vast majority of these cells are glial cells, and the ones with halos, which is, looks like about half, are probably the oligodendrocytes. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, critter. We've given you the model now of an oligodendrocyte. You can see it's basically what we call the myelination cell. This is a thing that puts the insulation around the wires. It does it in three dimensions. Here is your famous astrocyte. Okay, it does not have a fatty myelin sheet around it, but this is the blood-brain barrier, isn't it? Because you got some of these little stars or rays in the star wrapping around the blood vessels, and you got some of these other guys wrapping around neurons and nerve processes. So that is the blood-brain barrier. So I really like it. Sometimes the people talk about blood-brain barrier as a physiologic concept, but it's an anatomic concept. It's a spiny astrocyte. Here's a microglia. Well, it's called micro because it's the smallest. But another thing that's very confusing, even though it's micro in size, it's macrophage in function. So, you know, most of the neurons and the glial cells are of neuroectoderm origin, but this little guy here, comes from the macrophage line. And of course, the glial cells, which are the only ones that look like true epithelial cells lining the ventricles, lining the choroid plexus, lining the aqueducts. These are your ependymal cells, you know, making your cerebral spinal fluid and keeping that uh, a central canal and CSF space nice and separated from the rest of the brain. Uh, when I showed you this picture, I said the cells that are really small could very easily be possibly microglia. The ones with the halos are probably uh, oligodendros. But you're probably thinking, well, here's blood vessels. Where are the astrocytes? Could this be an astrocyte? Could this be an ast? You don't really know because you don't see the stars in the, the, the rays in the star. But if you did a, uh, uh, in, an immunostain to show the proteins that are in the astrocytes, they go by various names. You can now understand why these cells are the astrocytes, because they look like stars. And it looks like you could probably pick out about 12 or 15 of them here. And probably almost all the other cells you see with the halo are the oligos, aren't they? So uh, let me just uh, say something 
uh, now, otherwise I might not say it. If you have a tumor and the tumor cells look like a lot of them have a little halo around it, you could probably guess that it's an oligodendroglioma. Because remember, tumors often look like the cells from which they arise. That's not the problem with astrocytes, though, because in the astrocytoma, or what you neuro or neurosurgeon guys just refer to as glioma, even though you call it a glioma, it's really an astrocytoma. Because these other glial cells, when they form tumors, they don't call them gliomas. You call them oligodendrogliomas. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one, which I think is over here. And you're going to see the world's most beautiful oligos. Uh, if I had my friends here who won some Nobel Prizes in pathology, and I said, is this white matter where there's a lot of myelin and there are not too many neurons, would you just call these oligodendrocytes? They would probably say, yeah. And then if I said, well, if I told you this was a tumor that had a lot of calcifications, could this also be an oligodendroglioma? They would say, yeah, I knew that too. So, you know, you guys are like us. You never want to admit you're wrong. And of course, that's just part of human nature. And I'll tell you, um, I'm, I don't want to make fun of the neurosurgeons, but that uh, ego is not present in neurosurgery. You guys are are under a lot of stress. You guys are under a lot of pressure. You guys are not expected to know histopathology. But all of the neurosurgeons I've ever met had a true, you know, humility for relying on us, you know, to show them something rather than pretend like they knew it themselves. Of course, you take other types of surgeons and other types of internists, and that's always not the case. So, you know, I'm just showing my biases over here. Uh, these are microglia for the most part. If you want to think that maybe this has a multinucleated faction here or here or here, you may think, well, the microglia are doing what macrophages normally do because they're direct, they're forming giant cells. And when you see an area of increased cells within the brain, it's usually going to be a reaction to something. It, if you look at the cells around it, they can very often look the same. So you would probably call this a uh, gliosis, remember, nonspecific gliosis following injury, whether it's a stroke, whether it's a hemorrhage, whether it's a tumor nearby, whether it's trauma. And you would probably just end it at that. And even though it's called gliosis, you could have some astrocytes. Uh, you can maybe have some oligos mixed in. But for the most part, the glios are the microglia. Okay, and that last but not least, here's our last guys. And these are the easiest ones to figure out because they're the only glial cells that look like epithelial cells. None of these other cells look like epithelial cells. And even though it's epithelium, you know, this is the same stuff that's lining the choroid plexus, which is making your spinal fluid. And I'm basically near the end of what I wanted to say. I did not want to go into any specific diseases. In real life, after I have given this introduction to our facility, I then spend about six hours going into the uh, more specific CNS diseases. But these are the principles they should keep in mind. And really, they are not different from the original principles we talked about on day one when we talked about introduction to pathology. I'm going to show you two more fun slides. So uh, because I was given six webinars or 12 hours, I will spend three of them or six hours to talk about all of those topics which I showed you over here. That's going to be three webinars, six hours, and then I will spend one hour not loafing around and doing nothing because my son is a really fine ophthalmologist and he made a movie a couple days ago and it's on my website and by the way all of my old uh, neuro and everything else talks are at my website medicalschoolpathology.com but I didn't want to say this uh, in any of my uh, recordings but I will tell you uh, my son has been appointed to be uh, Donald Trump's uh, ophthalmologist because he's a retinal surgeon 
and they, he still has strong ties with the military, the Navy. So they asked him a couple of weeks ago. But I don't know if they asked him or they ordered him, but he is the White House uh, Donald Trump ophthalmologist right now. Then we're going to take another two-hour webinar to do lab. Okay. Now, I notice in all of these new curriculums they have, they don't like to show real diseases under the microscope, but I do anyway. And sometimes if I don't have enough time, I don't have a lab. But I guarantee you, we're going to have a full two-hour lab. And I don't tell the students to get off of their chairs and they have to go into the uh, a lab where there's stinky formalin. I actually bring the microscope right before their very eyes and I blow up things for them and I move the screen around. So this is not a picture. This is a real slide of a brain. You can see meninges here. You can see the various layers of the uh, cerebral cortex. If you remember, there's a whole bunch of them, but to tell you the truth, I forgot them. I just go by the basis of identifying the cells from the algorithms that we previously talked about. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of our microscope there for a second. And I'm going to uh, tell you what our very last, our sixth webinar will be, is every year, at the end of the year, uh, this is Puerto Rico, and it's a tropical paradise. And it has beautiful mountains and massive rainforests all over the place. So every year at the end of the year, I find an exotic, jungle place. And this is one where you practically have to be a rocket scientist to figure out where it is. Our school is about 10 miles from here, but you go down a little road and then you turn down a road that's so steep, even if you had a four wheel drive, you go about a mile, you pass by a giant radar tower that keeps the planes at San Juan International from uh, bumping into each other. I picked out a jungle spot. It's not too far from some microwave tower, so we can get a signal to create a hot spot from a um, cell phone. And then not only do we have the students trek out here into deep jungle, but we also broadcast it worldwide. And this is gonna be the fifth year that we're doing this. And this is the high point of my year every year. But I must admit, talking to you guys could very well run a close second. So I am very, very happy to have been here. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I know Simon's going to make a nice movie and uh, maybe he'll put it online somewhere. And I'm finished uh, opening up my mouth. Very good, John. Excellent. Excellent. I wish I was a student again. And I'm sure that other students will say that they're glad they're students listening to you. Okay, we'll start off. Simon, uh, would you want to have any commentary or something says, John? Uh yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tom. It's like always a, a privilege to, to be in your lectures, but even more so to be in such an intimate audience. And uh, I can tell uh, from experience that I really enjoyed uh, your labs. You know, when you take us down into that world and you talk, uh, we, we fall into this world. It's like a magical kingdom as you go, you take us over the hills and valleys into these little places. And it's really fascinating. But it's funny, it's elusive because pathology is one thing that you feel you, you're confident in. And then where did it go? Somehow I, I forget, I need to go back there and, and, and learn. And I wish I could be as good as some of the students are in your classes. I wonder how did they, how did they get to that level? But I'd like to thank you for uh, allowing me to do very well on my medical school uh, pathology, my basic pathology course. And I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to more of your lectures. Thank you, Simon. I'm always like thrilled to talk to you. Whatever you say, I know I don't deserve. <laughs> well, well, John, I'll tell you, I, you know, for, I think I probably echo the sentiments of a lot of doctors. Pathology was painful taking back, back in my day, you know, 30, 40 years ago, because, you know, you had to peer over a microscope and you had so many students, you know, around, and you wouldn't really have any time with a professor to ask questions and stuff. Uh, it seems, and it's such an important subject. You know, I, I wish I was a kid again, taking it, taking it now. Both to have people like you, and also the technology the, that uh, allows you. It seems that you can see the slides better. I remember looking over a microscope, having the professor say, "Can you see that? Can you see that?" And I really wouldn't 
see anything, I'd say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But now, but now it's kind of, uh, kind of better. Thanks again. You know, I, once again, I don't think I deserve it, but I certainly appreciate it. But if you guys are going to be saying those nice things to me, I'm going to have to start traveling incognito. There we, there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if anybody wants to see an entertaining uh, educational experience, watch some of your videos. Uh, you know, the, it's just it's fun. Learning pathology seems like it's fun, it's fun. and, I, and I'm it sure is. like uh, the students tell you that all, all the time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's enjoy, very enjoyable. You know, you know one one thing you said, John, that, that kind of got me thinking was you talked about the molecular basis of disease and how it all. You said that to me in a remark the other day, how all disease starts at the cellular level level. Now, with the increase in resolution, the power of the computer res and, and, and the microscopes now getting better and better and better, do you find do you find it more interesting now to you? Or well, I find it overwhelming, and I find it difficult to tell you the truth. And now, everything I teach in pathology, especially with regards to etiology. I have to really get smart in genetics. I mean, I, I teach a chapter called genetic diseases and those are classical. And I, I go to as many uh, genetic, high level genetic sequencing, you know, conferences as I can. And I want to tell you something, I have a hard time following those guys. They're like from another planet. Mm -hmm. And I know they're brilliant and I know what they're talking about, but they don't seem to be able to come down to planet earth. So if you guys know of any really good, appropriate, you know, genomic type uh, presentations that are also understandable by human beings. Please let me right. know. Well, we're going to try to develop a genomics community because we have one, uh, Simon will tell you, we have one part of the website that has a genomic studio. We hope to get, you know, people like you that are in their field, that know it, and that can explain it in uh, hopefully understandable ways because, again, most most doctors are pretty, 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 um, uh, not very knowledgeable in genomics. You know, that's a field that most docs, I don't yeah. know if you're that way, John, when you were a student and, and Simon, yeah. but for me, it was barely understandable. Basic genomics was barely understandable for me. And John, I'll tell you something. You don't have to feel bad or you don't have to feel old because I can tell you, even the students who came out of residencies or school like three or four years ago, in three or four years, it's completely changed anyway. So it's no, it's no more daunting to these young, smart guys than it is to us old guys. Yeah. Well, hopefully we have a platform to help bridge the gap and to make things interesting. So, so one area of pathology, path, path, is there, is there a field, pathology, genomics? Is there a... Well, there's molecular pathology, and even though it's called okay. molecular, it's really genetic. In fact, when I give my webinars, uh, the best and biggest molecular genetic lab in Chicago is the one that sponsors me. They pay for my webinars, and that's GoPath. I'm not supposed to give them ads, uh, but I do give them certainly a lot of appreciation, and they have been paying for me for the last eight years. Oh, okay. Oh, very good. Yeah, it just seems, yeah, it seems like a field that's just going to increase. I mean, the, the closer, I mean, the molecular basis now, micro, being able to distinguish molecules now and, and, that, and starting to manipulate those molecules effectively and starting to alter the code, moving DNA around, editing DNA. Strap it, put on your seatbelt, folks. <laughs> Some, some things are going to be happening. And, you know, one thing I was surprised at, John, I read a book uh, called Genes. Uh, it was by a Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, physician. And it was an understandable book. Uh, but I was surprised how responsible the genomics community is. It's self-policing. You know, they really think, you know, they're on a power keg and they're going to be really careful uh, because of editing and stuff, and but they police themselves a lot, and there's a lot of review of what what is done, uh, etc. Do you have any comments on that, John? No, but I I think it would be very very exciting if in some future webinar in a few years or less, you know, 
rather than show you an oligodendrocyte, you know, that has a little defect in the myelin that you can see, I'd like to show you a, a section of a DNA molecule that causes schizophrenia, you know? Right, and, you right. Know, I mean, it's. So I, I think we're coming closer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, when they can, you know, the, the better microscopes get, the better identification. You know, one field that fascinates me: nanomedicine, where they manipulate molecules and they can see molecules. What they do. Uh, that's one field I think it's going to be the key to discovering uh, the molecular basis of a lot of cancers. Now, have you seen any improvements? Uh, do you feel any improvements in the Diagnosis of cancer through molecular science I, I, and pathology. I think, in terms of understanding, massive improvement. You know, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we thought not cancer, but like all diseases are caused by evil spirits. And then yeah. we realized, you know, thanks to Dr. Birkow, that uh, there are real cellular changes. You know, that that kind of changed a little bit. But I think that eventually this is just going to become clearer and clearer and clearer. Well, I, I hope they can find uh, a way to alter age because I like to be alive for all these things coming. <laughs> but I don't. I think we're the last. I, I, people think I'm crazy when I say this, John. But I say that I think we're the last generation that will not be able to determine how long they live. Well, you know, John, when I was in medical school. Uh, which is about, you know, eight, that's before they had horses, okay? Yes, when I was in medical school, we knew that someday would come where you could uh, put genes into people and it would cure their disease. And I always ask my students every year when we talk about this, I said, do you know of one single person or any of your patients or anybody you ever heard of whose disease was cured because they put good non-mutated genes inside of them and unfortunately i still haven't had any real positive responses you know we read about things that are happening but i don't think there's a massive number of people with real diseases now that have been cured by gene therapy mm -hmm. they, they always say it's right around the corner and maybe it is yeah yeah it, it seems to be happening every day different different types of uh uh, I think it was today I was reading about, uh, especially like things like Alzheimer's and about genetic defects. I posted a story today on on, on, on hypertension. Right, they discovered, not discovered, but they, uh, they found 107 different genes that are associated with hypertension. Now, I, I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, I think that the, they're starting to identify uh, more accurately what could possibly genetic, genetically predispose someone. Of course, there's an environment, there's always the environment influence too, but what can someone be pre-exposed to uh, genetics and how they can alter your lifestyle if they, say, examine your genes, just like Angela Jolie with the B BRCA gene, how, how they can you know, advise you on, on your behavior and your diet, exercise, etc. So they certainly exciting. Well, let me wrap this up, John. Legal, uh, legally, we'll get off the air and, and schmooze. But let me just wrap this up. So thank you very much, John. Stay here. We're just going to end this officially. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It was a joy. It really was a joy. Thank you. Thank you so much.